aspect of it. And you can uh, take the genetic material out of the bacteria or virus. So in, in case of viruses, they can, they are, the genetic material can also be uh, RNA instead of DNA. So in that case, we also have to uh, do one step. We have to uh, prepare the complementary DNA sequence of that RNA uh, template. Uh, then there is library preparation. Here we do some modification. Uh, first, do uh, the fragmentation of the DNA. So uh, the DNA fragments are uh, the DNA fragments are generated either via sonication, uh, that is a random fragmentation method. There are some chemical methods, and there are some enzymatic methods such as fragmentation. And after the uh, fragmentation, we have to do some sort of modification of those. Uh, DNA fragments. So generally what we do, we attach two key sequences with each fragment of DNA. One, to understand which sample the fragment belong to. In next generation sequencing, we can uh, like perform sequencing of multiple samples together to or pool them together to reduce the overall cost. And the flow cells uh, or sequencing instruments provided by Illumina can generate a huge amount of data. So in a single sequencing run, we can sequence maybe hundred or thousands of organisms together. So that's why <clears throat> we have to provide a unique sequence that will tell, tell us the identity of the fragment or the sample from the which the fragment is coming from. And another one is uh, one sequence that will help it to ligate with the uh, instrument's flow cell. Then. Uh, there is a step called sequencing. So in Illumina, the sequencing is called uh, sequence by synthesis. So we get to know the sequence of our uh, genomic region or fragment by synthesizing a complementary strand of the sequence. And uh, this, uh, this synthesis goes on from 5 dash to 3 dash. And for after each uh, base incorporation, so the sequencing Maybe we have a fragment of 500 nucleotide, and we want to, we want to sequence only 100 uh, nucleotides out of the 500 nucleotides. So what it will do, each uh, cycle, it will add one base, just like our uh, Sanger sequencing. But instead of termination, uh, the uh, termination sequence, the fragment is attached uh, with a fluorochrome that will be excited with a laser. And uh, after that, the emitting intensity will be captured by a uh, high resolution camera. It's, it's like a microscope only. And uh, those uh, color of laser determines the base. So Illumina had four channel chemistry. So for four bases, ATGC, there are four different uh, lasers or fluorochromes and fluorochromes. And each color used to represent one base. And later on, uh, they will be uh, stored as a base call files. And using computational and bioinformatics tool, we have to first demultiplex the sample, means segregate these belonging to a particular sample uh, to a single file. And coming to the next next step or fourth step, uh, that is the mm, hello. And the fourth step is drawing inference from the data. So as we have fragmented the gen uh, genome into small pieces, so we don't know which fragment is coming from which region of the whole genome. So first, we have to align that to uh, arrange those fragments in a, uh, uh, according to the genome. Uh, then we perform, in case of molecular epidemiology, we generally use uh, variants. Uh, the variants are more meaningful to us. So we perform variant calling. So uh, from the aligned reads or arranged reads, we check uh, which bases or which positions are not actually matching with our uh, provided reference genome. And uh, the outcome then stored as variant call files. Uh, is it clear to everybody? Any questions from anyone? Hello. Hello. Yes. 
starting from 6 to 10 so the uh, the base content like there is a certain arrangement of base content in uh, this 6 to 8 base uh, nucleotide sequences that we are attaching with the dna fragment so that you have to note down during the library preparation and say ki this particular sample uh, we have attached this uh, arrangement of uh, nucleotides uh is this uh, does this answer your question okay and yeah yes mm-hmm. so those are known as uh, like adapters so adapters are provided by the kit manufacturers only so these adapters are common for like whatever sample we have like if we have bacterial yes. sample viral sample or any so it, it does not matter so uh, the ngs uh, with the ngs there is advantage is that the same library preparation kit you can use for any organism even for uh, you can use the same kit uh, if you even don't know the organism so there is no sequence specificity it just ligates to a particular uh, like if you have a sample and you provide adapters and perform a pcr steps it will attach to all the dna fragments <laughs> Thank you. Oh. So, uh, before going into uh, more towards uh, molecular epidemiology, uh, these are the broader application of NGS. So there are multiple NGS technologies as well as there, there are a lot of application that has been uh, demonstrated in as research as well as diagnostic and other healthcare purposes. So the first one. Uh, is the genomics it is known as the uh, wgs and wes there are other techniques such as targeted sequencing uh, in the last day someone mentioned about targeted sequencing so this will come as uh, under the genomics umbrella and uh, from this you can identify uh, structural changes in dna like uh, insertion deletion and uh, single point mutations as well as um, other changes like uh, in in case of cancer you can understand uh, if there are larger changes uh, like copy number variation uh, like one copy of uh, some chromosome is increased or some portion of the chromosome has translocated to a different location those phenomena you can understand with the whole genome and a whole exome data set and in in case of whole genome It, it, the name says it all it is uh, we are sequencing the complete genome of the organism in case of wes uh, we are actually targeting the coding regions of dna only so in our case uh, the size of uh, in our case the hum- size of human uh, coding region is only a fraction of the total size of the uh, our, our genome and uh, the size of uh, the size of our exon uh, the combined exons is around uh, 40 mb then there is transcriptomics here we quantify the gene expression uh, so in uh, if, if anybody has done qpcr in that uh, uh, experiment we use a specific primer to uh, to amplify a specific gene and in one experiment uh, we have we can only determine the expression of one gene only but in case of transcriptomics we can use rna seq and uh, get uh, extract the total rna uh, including the when we extract the rna it will come with both trna rnas and uh, mrnas so we do depletion of trna and other rnas and 
convert the mRNA to the complementary DNA sequence. And based on the complementary DNA sequence, we prepare a library. And after that, we quantify, we map and quantify uh, how much uh, like each gene is expressed. So maybe suppose one cell type is expressing uh, 5,000 genes. We have around 20,000 of protein coding genes, uh, but in cell type specific manner, there can be like four to 6,000 genes that has been expressed uh, in a specific cell, uh, cell type specific manner. But we can know the expression of all the uh, 6,000 genes or 10,000 genes together using the uh, RNA set experiments. And there are some epigenomic applications as well for in case of human or other mammal organisms like methylome sequencing, you can understand the methylation pattern and correlate it with the gene expression patterns. And then there is chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. We can understand transcription factor, uh, how they are playing role in gene expression and if they're bound to a certain set of genes. Attack sec, using attack sec, we can understand the chromatin accessibility. So uh, maybe uh, there is recruitment of some transcription factor, but a gene is not getting expressed. The fact maybe that the chromatin is not accessible in that particular region. So using attack sec, we can then understand which chromatins are open and ready to uh, translated, uh, transcribed by the polymerase. That can be understood by the attack sec sequencing method. And there comes the new domain of uh, of microbiome. So there are different types of microbiome people are doing research on. And all uh, this discovery uh, of newer organisms, we can, we can perform using the 16S sequencing, uh, combining with the next generation sequencing uh, as a end application. So coming into more into the infectious disease biology and uh, understanding the molecular disease, uh, molecular uh, epidemiology of disease, there are several points in an in, uh, cycle, life cycle of an infectious disease. First comes the portals of entry, uh, like how the uh, bacteria or pathogen uh, getting into our body, then host susceptibility. Hello, uh, any questions? So next uh, comes the host susceptibility. So even though like daily we are getting exposed to a lot of bacteria and uh, viral pathogens uh, from the air itself, but not everybody is developing disease. So there is a host factor as well, uh, like the uh, current situ situation of a host, their immune system, uh, which age group they belong to, they have any other disorders like other diseases like diabetes, hypertension, uh, that can add on to the particular uh, disease, uh, being susceptible to the disease. Then there can be uh, the infection. If we have already having an infection, we are susceptible. Uh, do you, uh, someone's mic is on. Uh, do you have a question? So next come the infection. Uh, if someone has already has some infection, they generally are susceptible to uh, like uh, getting more infections or open to more infectious pathogens. Uh, then coming into the side of pathogen, like what, what are the reservoirs? This we can understand the metagenomic approach. If we perform metagenomic analysis of soil, or the other elements that are that the host is exposed to, like water, food. We can understand the source of infections. Then there are portal of exits, like uh, how this pathogen is being transmitted from one organism, uh, like human or other uh, organism, to a different set of organism, and how the organism is being transmitted. So there are different 
mode of transmission of each organism, such as uh, some organisms can be airborne. So if someone is sneezing and they, then other the person nearby can contract the disease. And uh, there are some other modes like physical contact or coming uh, uh, across uh, like or coming up across like uh, surfaces that are contaminated with uh, airborne pathogen droplets that can also uh, cause the disease or can be a mode of transmission for pathogens. So uh, going in deep into the next generation sequencing, uh, there are two key file formats of uh, sequencing datasets. So the standard one, the more standard one is the fastq file. So the NGS data is uh, you get if you perform an NGS experiment either uh, in your facility, institute's facility, or in a, from a company, you will get the data in the fastq format. The fastq format looks something like this. So instead of the regular uh, FASTA files, so in regular FASTA file, you have uh, two uh, two lines. The first is a sequence identifier, followed by the nucleotide sequence or protein sequence. But in case of FASTQ format, uh, the format comes with some additional fields. Like the first uh, field is the identifier of the sequence uh, that is uh, denoted by the add the red. Uh, then there comes the sequence. The sequence the machine has detected based on the imaging. Uh, there then comes one uh, additional kind of information, uh, like how. Uh, so this will always come as positive, like plus ten. So there there are two ways uh, the sequence can be uh, paired end or single end sequencing. So this will be common for both. This is a uh, standard field. And the last line of a fast Q record will determine uh, or specify the quality of each basis that it has detected. So although uh, from here you can see that uh, uh, they kind of look like gibberish, uh, uh, alphabetical character and uh, alphanumerical characters with some special characters like semicolon and question mark. These characters is actually uh, is a ANSI uh, standard. So this each character represents a specific number. So in case of this T base, we know that the quality score uh, represented by colon is 25. So the 25 uh, is actually encoded, encoded by the colon. And the 25 represents the certainty that this T is a T. This T is not a. So how we understand the certainty of a base? So there is a scale called Fred quality scores. So this quality score starts from uh, 10 and goes up to uh, 40 currently for sequencing. So the 10, if some quality score is 10, that represents uh, there will be an error. Uh, the chance of error is 1 in 10. If the Fred quality score is 20. The chance of error is 1 in 100. Then if the score is 30, the error is rate is 1 in 1000. And lastly, if the Q quality score is 40, the chance of uh, getting or the wrong base will be 1 in 10,000. So based on the information I just provided. Can someone tell me what can be the uh, chances of error for this particular base? Like approximately, can someone tell me ki, uh, how much uh, there is a chance of error, margin of error uh, in this uh, T base call? Hello. Uh, 
Hello, can uh, someone tell me uh, if the queue's quality score is 25, what can be the chances of error? Anyone? Just uh, take a guess. Is it by fraction of hundreds? That means is one out of four. That's one over four. Uh, it it will be a bit more than uh, one out of hundred in the range. Your voice is not audible. Sorry. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Uh, I think some people are having issues with network. Okay. Mm. Then moving on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is another platform called Oxford Nanopo Technology. So recently, after uh, 2017, they have adapted the FastQ format like an industry standard. But previously, they used to have a format called uh, Fast5. So it's in a hierarchical format, and uh, it contained more information than the FastQ file. Although, <clears throat> As most of the tool, uh, the computational biology or bioinformatics tool pay, prefer uh, FastQ, uh, they have adapted the faster FastQ format for the race calling. And uh, although this format is uh, deprecated, you may find some data uh, in this format. So next, going on to uh, how we identify or use next generation sequencing data for pathogen discovery and molecular epidemiology. So first thing uh, with the NGS data, we have to perform certain analysis. So these are the key analysis steps mentioned here. We can have multiple samples uh, from different individuals, or we can have multiple uh, metagenome samples. Then first, we go through the QC step. We make sure the chances of base fall errors is less. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Q quality score. We generally try to keep the Q, Q quality score uh, as 20 for the filtering of the reads. So, first we check using a tool like Fast QC uh, to understand uh, the base overall base quality score from all the reads. Then we perform the read trimming. So. If we see there are a lot of low quality reads, like reads having base quality uh, Q value score of 10, we try to remove them from further analysis because uh, as we increase the uncertainty of base call be being wrong, the confidence of variant call also goes down. So we can't surely make an inference from our data. That's why we try to remove those biases beforehand. Then we uh, go through identification of the reference. So in case of bacterial uh, samples or viral samples, uh, although there are specific reference genomes, there can be multiple reference genomes as well. So to perform variant call more accurately, the first thing we have to perform to identify uh, which strain is actually uh, infected a patient or an individual. Uh, that can be done in two ways. We can uh, start by a uh, shorter MLST uh, scheme. Uh, and if we know the pathogen, we can take all the representative members or strains to identify particularly which strain is actually causing the infection. So MLST uh, takes some core part of the genome, uh, like for um, uh, the genes we use as quality control, like uh, the housekeeping genes or metabolic genes. And as they don't change much, uh, their location does not change much on different strain. We, we use those uh, sequences to identify particularly which strain is present in our sequencing data. The same can be done, or uh, the same can be done using uh, that recent some recent tools like taxonomical classifiers, Kraken and centrifuge that has been widely used in the field of metagenomics. Uh, using these tools, we can also uh, provide uh, the fast queue sequences directly to the tool, and it will tell us uh, the overall diversity of the sample, 
and it can identify up to strain level which strain is present in our data then after identification of the reference genome we uh, actually download the reference genome and prepare an uh, mapping index for read mapping and <clears throat> comparing with the reference position we perform variant calling and from the variant calling data we can further improve our multi locus uh, strain typing uh, experiment uh, in a higher resolution and from the variant information we can also identify the antimicrobial resistance if the sample has antimicrobial resistance based on some gen uh, predefined genomic uh, uh, information that has been already published or validated in some of the labs and to better understand how the transmission patterns are going on we can use to phylogenomics and uh, here they are mentioned of three methods the KMR tree method, the SNP tree method, and the uh, minimum spanning tree. All three methods will tell us uh, using a comparative genomics fashion, like we can take other representative samples from different regions and see uh, if our, the samples or sequences we have got are similar with particular region or not. So those can be understood by these phylogenomic methods. So this is a gen, uh, general uh, bird's eye view of the pathogen genomics uh, workflow before moving on to the uh, molecular epidemiology. So there can be add some additional step based on the requirements. And uh, if you're doing research in a similar domain, you may have to customize based on the pathogen also. So to perform the analysis, I think everybody has been previously familiarized with uh, Galaxy project. Galaxy project has almost every tool, bioinformatics tool available, especially uh, in terms of genomics and uh, chemoinformatics. So if you want to perform the nation sequencing data analysis uh, in, in the cloud, you can use Galaxy. You don't have to uh, go through the hassle of installing tools, changing parameters. Then if you are more inclined towards performing uh, the sequence analysis in your computer, you can uh, go to the Nextflow core community. So Nextflow is a kind of a framework to develop uh, pipelines for next generation sequencing data analysis. And it's, it's kind of working as a repository where community members can deposit their own pipelines and you can use them for your uh, research. Uh, then there are the resources like card database uh, for the antimicrobial resistance. You can get the genomic positions that are responsible for showing antimicrobial resistance from the card database. Uh, for the multi-locus uh, sequence typing, you can go to a database called pub MLST. Uh, there are some specific uh, resources for bacterial and pathogen genomics available. It's used to call Patrick. Now it is called BVBRC. Uh, they have a collection of data sets, uh, pathogen data sets curated from NCBI, SRA, and EBI. And they are uh, arranged on a basis of uh, their taxonomical fashion. So you can go there, you can get the antimicrobial resistance data and other patient information like which region the sample belong to or some additional information if they are provided in the respective publication. And recently, a tool was more popularized to understand the phylodynamics uh, of an uh, infectious disease. It's called Nextend. Although the tool started uh, as a dashboard for COVID-19 sequences, they have expanded their application to more pathogens uh, like tuberculosis, malaria, and a lot other. Uh, uh, is my uh, presentation clear to everyone? Uh, do you have any question? You can ask me now. And I'll be moving towards the example sections where NGS has been used uh, for. Uh, sir, a small query. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, for all the three trees, sir, any specific criteria for a particular data we, uh, we will pursue with this uh, particular tree? So uh, the three uh, 
you i have mentioned here uh, are like uh, like the common ones that are being used there are other methods as well so the first one i mentioned as the kmr based method so if you want to get the information very fast so you are in a hurry first you want to check how the strains are relating to uh, to each other or you have like metagenomic data where there are a lot of strains present instead of one single strain you will definitely perform a kmr based tree so in kmr based tree rather than uh, getting the genome in whole genome information together you are actually checking uh, some small stretches of the sequence that are known as the kmr so the k might be a number like 10 marks or 20 marks and based on the sequence similarity like uh, 10 or 20 uh, number of nucleotide similarity uh, you are checking if two strains or two organisms are similar or related to each other in terms of snp tree you are generally going towards more uh, purified population like one individual has infection of uh, covid 19 or tuberculosis so in a community settings what we will try to do we will sample like uh, some individuals 10 to 15 patients showing same symptoms same phenotype and they belong to the same locality and you will perform a uh, single nucleotide polymorphism calling or a single nucleotide variant calling using the pipeline and you will compare among different infections uh, in in this uh, snp tree and in the snp tree the assumption is that uh, you are going to compare similar uh, uh, like strains of of an organism in the minimum spanning tree the application is more towards you want to understand like which uh, individual uh, epidemiological uh, or endemic events are linked with each other so in last day dr krishnamurthy showed one graph like plot so that is a uh, minimum spanning tree so if you want to know, uh, know ki like the, this community infections are linked or not or the infection in a particular area is linked with uh, each other or not so then you will perform minimum spanning tree so rather than uh, generating a single tree or a rooted tree the minimum spanning tree will general uh, generate multiple uh, small small segments of a tree uh, the nodes will be uh, attached with each other and those small segments will uh, represent one out outbreak event okay thank you okay. so moving on to the application of next generation sequencing we all are aware that the covid outbreak started around 2019 first in china and then it spread across the globe uh we uh, in india we observed three main waves of covid-19 infection uh, starting from 2022 uh, 2022 so in case of uh, the covid actually uh, we generated the global the maximum amount of next generation sequencing data to understand the molecular epidemiology so this is the phylogenetic representation of different uh, sars cov2 clades so the sars cov2 clades actually represents the particular molecular characteristics of a strain so based on the similarity of their mutational patterns they are grouped into different categories and uh, uh, grouped into different clades or lineages so everybody reading news must have heard the term clade and lineage like this uh, lineage delta uh, strains or delta lineages are particularly spreading uh, in this time so in this phylogenetic tree the x axis represents the time uh, uh, along with the sars cov2 genome has been changed and you can you will be able to see the earlier strain uh, like in the case of 2020 the 19a was the primary strain and the most recent uh, one is the 24b so you'll see uh, with the time the strain has actually acquired a lot of mutation and along the path of its mutational trajectory uh, there were multiple intermediate strains uh, as well so from this phylogenetic tree uh, we have plotted against the uh, uh, time 
we can understand when actually at which point of time a particular clade has been evolved so uh, can can someone uh, tell me like uh, when the first omicron uh, strain was uh, observed uh, from this phylogenetic plot is it vis clearly visible to everyone Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, I'm asking a question. Like uh, nobody is. Uh, I, I am I audible. Sir, to actually, uh, at my place, uh, network is not very good. So your voice drops. Uh, that's why I wrote earlier also. So your voice is not audible. Might be audible for everyone, for but for not for me. Okay. So I am asking a question. Like, uh, can someone tell me uh, at which point? like the omicron cases started to show up from from this phylogenetic tree i request everyone to please participate sir in 2020 uh 2020 when that was not clear sir actually the slide was somewhat edited okay uh, no no the first omicron uh, if you can see my pointer first cases of omicron started to be observed uh, during uh, november or december Dece of december or november yes around november 21 no uh, around actually november 2020 sir november 2020 oh. so actually previously it was thought the omicron started to evolve or uh, spread in the end of 2021 uh, but genomic data has suggested the early uh, outbreak of omicron uh, like was present uh, in the end of 2020 itself so uh, by uh, the phylogenomic and comparative analysis we can understand uh, along the time uh, trajectory of time which strain evolved at which point of time then next moving on to if you want to understand how fast an organism is evolving so if a organism is evolving in a very faster rate it will uh, definitely get more chances of selection and more uh, virulent strain of that particular pathogen can come early uh, in respect to a pathogen that is not very uh, fast evolving so in case of covid uh, we have observed from the next generation sequencing data and uh, phylogenomics uh, that the rate of mutation uh, in the covid-19 genome is around 32 or 33 uh, substitution per year so the genome size of covid is around 30 kv or 30000 nucleotides so there is a chance uh, that each year at least uh, 33 nucleotides will be changed uh, in, in the next year strains so uh, this is one of the reason we observed uh, that even after developing vaccines uh, there are breakthrough infections in the community because the organism was so fast evolving although we designed a vaccine for the initial strain of 19a uh, the vaccine was a bit less effective to uh, or like the vaccine was not able to prevent in, uh, breakthrough infections in later point of time uh, because uh, the organism was getting mutated in, in a so frequent manner the uh, the antigen it produces was getting changed and the immune uh, the immunity or the immune cells or the antibodies our body is generating based on the vaccine uh, was not enough to neutralize those uh, strain of covid uh, 19 because the antigen was not 
able to bind with the antibody or the antigen was uh, not detected by the antibody. So the neutralization capacity of the vaccine decreased. So from using the whole genome sequencing data only, we are able to identify the, uh, the bacteria is uh, evolving around. Initially, the evolution rate was less when we started sequencing in 2020, the evolution rate was around 26 mutations per year. Now the mutation rate has increased after introduction of Omicron and other more virulent strain. The rate of uh, mutation is now around 33 substitution per year. And moving on to next. So this is a, a video, the genomic data uh, So the sorry, so the genomic data can also provide a snapshot of how the infection spread across the globe. So the samples we are collecting uh, in case of COVID, it was one of the major uh, uh, information that provided uh, from the sequencing itself. We collected those sequences. We uh, performed whole genome uh, analysis and assembly of those genomes. Then we performed the identification of strain type or clade type based on the mutational pattern. And when we uh, overlapped the data with geographical locations and uh, their collection date, uh, the next strain database has prepared a snapshot of uh, different strain, how they came to play globally. So in this video, uh, you will see uh, there is a uh, there is a time bar starting from 2020 and uh, as the time increments so you will see there are five primary lineages and the number of cases they are increasing the proportion is changing initially and the first case was started in Wuhan China and as the time passes by there is an introduction of newer strain called uh, 20B we'll see uh, this uh, uh, time uh, timeless video in our hands-on session as well and uh, as you can see, as the time is passing by, like uh, from the November, the new cases started to uh, be observed in other geographical location. And as the uh, time passed, we get to learn about new uh, kind of strains of SARS-CoV-2, like uh, alpha, gamma, and kappa. And their proportion and uh, how they are getting uh, accumulated in different geographical locations based on the sequencing data only. So this is one of the examples. Uh, this is a, one of the real-time examples. We used uh, the NGS or whole genome sequencing data to track the epidemiology of COVID-19 cases globally. Uh, if anybody has uh, any questions, uh, they can ask me now regarding these uh, COVID-19 cases. Next, I'll be moving on to uh, how we use uh, molecular uh, next generation sequencing for tuberculosis epidemiology. Hello. So please move on. I guess no queries. Okay, sure. So next, uh, uh, this this is a uh, like minimum spanning tree that has been developed using the single nucleotide polymorphs that we have captured from the next generation sequencing data. Uh, in this particular publications, the authors have used. Uh, say SNP differences between two strain as as a cutoff of 12 to specify if event is epidemiologically linked with each other. So these all cases are from Prague of Czech Republic. And uh, when the authors performed the analysis, the minimum spanning tree uh, using a clustering method, uh, they observed for six clusters of tuberculosis infections. And based on that inference, when they correlated with the other phenotypic information, uh, the, like the vicinity of the individuals uh, in these different clusters, they observed 
uh, that uh, the particular uh, if a particular patient is coming grouped together with one individual the infection generally uh, spread among them from a single source so in case of cluster one you can see that the primary source of infection was the cz286 sample which later on infected uh, rest of the sample so they can be like their neighbors or the pe people they regularly come in contact and if the numbers in between represents the differences among these groups the number of patients that are different uh, among these groups so in case of the clusters you will see they have very less uh, snp differences sometimes it is uh, even one so in case of uh, individuals having less than 12 or 15 uh, snp changes or mutational changes among the strains sir hello sir, yes. Hear... yes yes sir uh, sir uh, one doubt sir what is the test is he uh, is that 26 uh, this is what sir which one 26 uh, this general, uh, many nice. numbers, uh, what is this, sir? Yes, these are the patient identifiers. Okay, sir. This is individual or uh, this is a of... this is a uh, this is the individual ID of a patient. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. The particular ID of a patient. So okay. and this uh, numbers in between the lines represents how many SNPs are different from this uh, this tuberculosis case to this tuberculosis case. So if the number is less than 12 or 15, it has been generally accepted in case of tuberculosis that uh, those cases are generally linked. And in practicality, we also see that if two strains are very similar with each other, uh, they are generally belonging to same neighborhood or the cases belong to same neighborhood or same family. And next, coming to a more advanced example of phylogenetics. So there are six known lineages of tuberculosis. But in this representation, the author only uh, with 6,000 genome sequence data. So each line represents one sample. Uh, but as the density of samples is very high, around 6,000, uh, they are uh, clumping with each other. So there are six primary lineages of tuberculosis is known. Uh, but in the data set, authors have only observed uh, four lineages. And you can clearly see if uh, the lineages are same, they are grouping together very strongly. So the mutational pattern uh, is very same across the lineages. So if you like, if you are uh, doing an epidemiological study in an area, and if you found uh, in a 10 kilometer or five kilometer radius, people are getting infected with the same strain of bacteria based on your uh, Sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing, you can surely say all these events are epidemiologically linked and the individual having least number of mutation are the sources of the infection. Because the select in, in case of selection, in uh, case of selection of pathogen or any other organisms, uh, addition of newer mutations that are beneficial for their survival uh, is the uh, way they evolve. So if the number of mutation increases, so that uh, from one individual to other individual based on their pathogen profile, uh, that means uh, the pathogen is transmitting from a, is, uh, in a community fashion and evolving in the transmission process as well. So in the phylogenetic tree, the inner circle or uh, the inner circle boxes represents the color of lineages and the outer circle circle represents a uh, phenotype so in case of tuberculosis it's a, it's a it's a challenging disease for low and middle income countries as well as the western countries so a, uh, like when we provide treatment challenge the we are supposed to think that bacteria will get killed or if doctor provides such medicines for tuberculosis will get cured but the thing is that uh, based on the treatment we provided for last 50 60 years the bacteria uh, has started to evolve so the bacteria is getting mutation on the regions or proteins that is being targeted by those drugs 
there are several drug resistance development mechanisms in the bacteria but the overall thing is that the uh, acquisition of mutation is actually helping uh, the bacteria or pathogen to survive uh, irrespective of drug challenges so in case of tuberculosis drug resistance is a major global challenge and the outer circle in this phenotype uh, in this phylogenetic tree represents the phenotype of the patients uh, that has been observed uh, during the sample collection so this was determined by the uh, drug susceptibility testing where you culture the bacteria and provide the drug to see if the bacteria grows or not and you can see one interesting phenomena uh, that in case of drug resistance patterns as also the susceptible strains are not that tightly grouped although they can be grouped in a region specific manner but uh, in this particular phylogenetic tree the region uh, specific information is missing but the drug resistance especially the samples with multi drug resistance and uh, extreme extensive drug resistance are uh, grouping in small groups together so that means that they have uh, kind of like similar mutational profile and uh, generally these kind of like uh, groupings are linked to uh, community transmission or uh, how, like the patients the tuberculosis patient generally goes to a particular uh, clinic or center in their uh, village or city to get the drugs and in such uh, in uh, uh, such interaction someone might have got infected or the infection can be uh, spread uh, in, in like the, the, the two individuals, one with TB and another one with suspected TB, visiting the same healthcare or they are coming in contact in a healthcare settings. Uh, because TB is a, a aerosol, TB spreads via aerosols. So if one is sneezing, they will, or, or coughing, uh, they will leave residue or tuberculosis uh, in surfaces as well as in the air. And if uh, like some group of persons are visiting some health center uh, for TB and other diseases, uh, they have the chance of contracting the disease as well. So next, another example for tuberculosis, we also use the SNP differences directly uh, for and to understand uh, like the epidemiologically, uh, epidemiological events are linked or not with each other. So in this particular case, we have compared the pairwise SNP differences of uh, 200 samples. So we can see uh, a, a, there is a pillar uh, near zero. So this actually does not represent the number zero exactly. So this bar represents the number of pairs or number of pairs of sample that have very less uh, differences among them. And we first saw that uh, the samples are having uh, like 39 samples out of the 200 samples are showing SNP differences less than, uh, less than 15. And when we performed the phylogenetic analysis, we saw from those samples, there are two distinct epidemiological events where uh, two group of people, one major group of people infected with, with a certain strain of tuberculosis and there is a small group of people also sharing same infection pattern and next coming into more holistic understanding uh, like sir yes sir what is the snp sir snp is single nucleotide polymorphism like the single nucleotide change uh, in a bacteria or an individual Okay, sir. Thank you. So next, coming to more holistic understanding uh, of how we can use the lineage information and uh, drug resistance information in combined fashion to better understanding the epidemiological landscape in area. We can see the first first plot represents the proportion of uh lineages or strain types of tuberculosis uh, that comes with a particular drug resistance phenotype and uh, based on the proportion we can also see if there is any bias of particular lineage to be uh, uh, sh to show particular drug resistance phenotype in case of uh, lineage 2 uh, we see that 
the lineage to samples that are uh, that reported from India actually comes with a lot of regressions phenotypes. So, uh, so that is when this report was suggested. So, uh, the the authority that uh, controls the diagnosis of tuberculosis in India and uh, recommends the treatments from WHO, they suggested that if you if you observe any lineage to samples, you should definitely perform drug resistance phenotype uh, in a priority fashion than any other lineages. So such informations can also be determined using the uh, whole genomic uh, whole genome data set itself. So the B plot is actually tells about the uh, SNP part of it like which particular mutation is associated with drug resistance and which particular mutation is uh, is not actually contributing from the drug resistance phenotype so this is a uh, like uh, notion for representing protein or nucleotide changes so the first uh, letter v represents uh, the amino acid in reference then there is the position and then comes the uh, the change in the nucleotide, which will actually cause that particular phenotype like drug resistance. So this is like, like the overall summary of how you can use uh, NGS sequencing data uh, in a, understanding the epidemiological events and how the epidemiological events are linked and how you can establish that particular correlation using the next generation sequencing data. So, any questions from the presentation or any, any particular uh, topic of next generation sequencing? Uh, sir? Yes. Sir, Pinotop means it's a variant, uh, sir. Pinotop, Pinotop means. Oh, which one? Sorry. Phenotype. Phenotype means like the phenotype can be anything. It can be resistance or increased virulence. A phenotype is something that is measurable and that is the outcome of certain event. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, so, uh, if nobody has any question, I'll move on to the hands-on session part. Yes, sir, please. So, this is the hands-on part. I'll uh, just paste this slide in the chat. And uh, there are some questions, uh, like this all are web uh, resources, so nobody has to download anything if uh, you have a laptop or computer available because the next train will take some of the resources of your computer as well to load so if you have your laptop with you uh, you can start uh, the hands-on session with me i'll paste all the details in the chat Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, NSG means it is a, pa, uh, as a pa part of wet uh, lab as well as uh, in silica work, right, sir? Uh, NGS, NGS uh, the library preparation part or the sample preparation part is wet lab. And the uh, rest of the understanding, like uh, the analysis of data, is all in silico. Okay, sir. I thought that uh, NSG means uh, full of uh, computation work like that. I said. No, no, definitely uh, there. There is what part as well. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so everyone, please uh, check the chat. Uh, there are some like uh, quiz-like questions and. Uh, uh, they are based on the uh, link that has been provided. You can browse those uh, repositories and uh, start answering the question. And if you have any doubts, you can always ask me.
So let's start with the next trend. Uh, everybody has laptops or some of you are, uh, have joined from mobile. Hello. Yes, sir. So, uh, have you have you seen the chat or? Uh, I'm just seeing this one. So there is a link first uh, that is called Next Train. So everybody can open that link, and uh, it will open the SARS-CoV-2 phylogenetic tree that I have shown earlier in my presentation. And we'll perform some basic analysis using the next train data set itself. So everybody able to view the my screen. Yes. So, okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> the first question uh, comes which uh, clades are classified as Delta uh, and Omicron? So, if uh, you have opened uh, this phylogenetic tree in your computer or you're, you're viewing from your mobile, uh, can someone tell me which uh, uh, clades like? I'm giving an example. Like 21A is classified so, as Delta. The clay 21M is of Omicron. 21A is Omicron, yes. And uh, which one are Delta? So 21J and 21A. Hmm. Yes. So uh, like the most of the analysis has been already conducted by the next gen team. Uh, that's why we can directly visualize this kind of information. But when we have to do by ourselves, we generally have to follow a computational biology uh, pipeline or use the Galaxy database. So next, moving on to uh, my next question. So there are multiple waves of COVID-19 infection. And there is a second link provided from uh, Waldometers.info. So I, I'm just giving you the general idea. Like the first wave of infection was from, let's say, uh, March 1st to of uh, August uh, 1st, 2020. So th there, there is a calendar sign uh, in the date range column, uh, the date range uh, info field. If I go there and select the date ranges I have just said uh, of the first work, let's say I uh, start with March 1st of 2020. And I want to look into the strains that was present uh, the duration of first work as uh, my limit. So let's select. Uh, I, I just want to look into the strains so up to 2020 of August of 2020. So let's select the August 1st of, uh, or maybe the end of August 2020. And if, if I select the date range, I just have to click outside uh, of this box and it will load um, all the strains that were present uh, the, during this period. So how many strains are there? How many strains you are able to see? Or how many clades are you able to see from this plot? Sir, here 20B and 20C you can see. Sir. No, no. Yeah, like there, there, there is a box here. How, how many you see? In the six, top? Six, six box you can see, sir. Yes. Sir, one dot. What is this 19A, 19B? This is all uh, variant, sir. Uh, these are the nomenclature of SARS-CoV-2 strain. So these okay. are different. Dif these are different variants. So this uh, you have 
what you have heard in the news this 20a is spreading or delta is spreading so this is a nomenclature scheme okay so it's like a, a delta omicron like that yes okay, yes thanks so initially there was no such classification because the fatality uh, was not as severe as delta so the previous strain not had any who classification such as alpha beta gamma and delta so in the yes sir now now are you showing the interface sir or uh, slide sir now you are working uh, i am i am just showing the, this is the hands on session so i am just uh, showing the interface, interface sir. yes Okay. So that's why these are mostly uh, using a uh, the, the initial names. The the nineteen actually represents the year, and A represents the first train we observed. So it started with A, B, C, D, and the last two digits of year. Later on, a newer nomenclatures were introduced, such as pangolin. Uh, but uh, you can also uh, browse uh, like which pangolin lineages are present uh, from the data so in the color by clade uh, you can search for pangolin pangolin lineages so it will change the nomenclature to a newer scheme that was uh, introduced during sars cov 2 infection So this 2020A will be changed now. So the pangolin started uh, in a similar fashion. They started to start uh, started to know, put nomenclature of different uh, lineages uh, starting from A, then adding an additional number. And uh, even if there is subpopulation of different uh, strains in, in a particular lineage, they started to assign numbers with dots. So they started with B, maybe they started with A, then came A1, then came A.A1.1 .A .1 in, in a similar fashion. So moving on to the uh, like third quiz question, uh, what are the most divergent strains of SARS-CoV-2? So in that particular plot, uh, the plot we are seeing here now, is represented in the uh, timeline of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the branch length actually represents the time that has been that has passed from one strain to another. So for that, we have to change. Uh, like I'm resetting to it to clade, and I'm resetting the time also in the date range to see what is the most recent strain of SARS-CoV-2. So I have changed it to color by clade. Now I am resetting to it to date. So uh, here I have to uh, scroll it, uh, scroll a bit to get this uh, toggle button. So here it is selected as time. Now if I click on the divergence. So it will, it, it's, it's around, there is around 6 million data points. So it takes uh, a bit of time to load. So if I uh, put the divergence as the branch link parameter, we'll be able to see there, there are uh, some rearrangements uh, in the overall phylogenetic tree layout. So the branch length means the initial one is considered as zero. And as new strains are introduced, the branch length increases uh, based on the mutation they acquire with time. And so from the information I've provided, key, the starting will be 19A and it will be the branch length zero. And the scale is increasing uh, along with the X axis or maybe in the right side. So can someone tell me like which strain is the newest one from this phylogenetic tree? Twenty four A J N one, sir. Uh, yes, twenty four. So, yes, twenty four B J N. Yes, that's correct. So the newest strain or the most divergent strain is twenty four B 
uh, which is also another which have also another nomenclature j1.11.1 uh, okay then uh, so how everybody is finding uh, this exercise is it boring or this is looking interesting to you Yes, sir. it's new to us, so we are interesting, interesting go through it. Yeah, I, I know. I talked about a lot of stuff. Maybe that is overwhelming for everyone. So that's why I designed this uh, simplified experiment so we can all perform it. Yes, sir. We just hear about NSG, NSG, NSG. So you are yeah, in this session, we are able to, we are able to uh, get the information regarding the transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So next, we move on to another uh, like simple experiment. OK, the, a lot of people also answering in the chat. I Sorry, I <laughs> missed your uh, comments. Uh, so next, we are moving on to another experiment with uh, tuberculosis. So uh, the thing is that the data that has been shown in the, the that, uh, data portal or browser is belonging from next generation sequencing. So in, in this case, uh, in this in this another tool that I have, I have provided link to, that is the TB uh, gen tool. So we can identify the type of tuberculosis strain. Like we are saying for COVID, we are saying 21A, 22A or something. Uh, but how to determine which one is 21A, 22A or lineage one or lineage two in case of tuberculosis? So here, there are multiple tools. There are mutation patterns that have been already recorded. And these tools matches your variant call file, uh, the ultimate product from the bioinformatic pipeline. And uh, based on the variations, genomic changes you have detected uh, that has been recorded. Yes, Anurag. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir yeah, one doubt, sir. NSG means mainly used to uh, observe the mutant uh, that only, yes, sir. Uh, so N NGS uh, has one application for variant detection, and uh, variant detection is being widely used for like can diseases as cancer. So if you search for variant calling or cancer, you'll see uh, NGS is being used to detect the variation in human genome to see that particular mutation is causing cancer in case of pathogen genome. Uh, this NGS. Uh, is used in the context of discovering genomic changes. But there are other applications also. The NGS can be used for uh, like uh, checking the gene expression, like how much a gene is getting expressed in a cell, in, in a human, or in a disease condition. So there are several other applications. The variant is one of the applications. OK, sir, thank you. So in the next experiment, let's, uh, I think it has loaded already. So they are already, they have this database, they have analyzed around some 670 samples, pre-analyzed samples that have been provided. So I have provided the ID of two samples and uh, you can download the variant call file or download the list of variants by just going uh, into the database in the uh, in, go to the reference data set section and uh, just by scrolling a bit you will find the select sample section of this database so you can just uh, delete the name that has been provided in the uh, list you can just paste the name i have provided and click on download vc so it will take uh, Uh, sir, this sample means uh, is one patient sampler, sir. This is, this is this is one patient. Yes. Uh, this uh, sample have the uh, sequence uh, sequence information, sir. Yes, the the sample has been sequenced, and uh, from the sequence, all the analysis have been performed. Now we have the list of variation genomic changes that has been keep on talking about genomic changes, genomic changes. So there is a file format for keeping the genomic variations. Uh, 
uh, that is called VCF or Variant Call Format. You can see it has been mentioned, download VCF. So VCF or Variant Call Format is a standard format for recording genomic changes. So, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So first, uh, let's identify uh, this particular sample, DR188673, which lineage it belonged to. So in the genotype lineage section, I'll go and the, you'll see uh, the authors of this tool or the developers of this tool has provided this arrow. And there is a box, there is a box appeared, upload the VCF file. So I'll go there, click on browse and uh, select the sample I have just downloaded, the DR18873. And just click on load. And then I'll click on genotype lineage. It will take a couple of seconds. Yes. Sir, I do have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, whether this is a tool or database? So this is a tool. So there is a distinction. Can we use something else other than this PB uh, genome? No. Uh, this is kind of like an example how for in case of tuberculosis, you can identify the lineage type. Uh, there are uh, do some other uh, analysis in this I means some other sample, some other genotype, something. No. So the thing is that if you are going to analyze other samples, you have to go to the uh, uh, Galaxy data, uh, Galaxy web server. So there is a collection of tools. Uh, as the uh, as I had a very like this course has very limited time. I did not show that whole analysis part. In no, general, Galaxy, we are doing it. Yeah. Okay. No, no, actually, it will take some time for analyzing even a single genome. If you are doing it first time, it will take maybe two to three hours to go through the whole process. So here I am showing the end product. Like after a pipeline completes, uh, you, you can go here and identify the different type of pathogen strains and their drug resistance phenotype. Sir? Okay, yes. Uh, sir, where we where we can get uh, that VCF file, sir? Like VCF PDB database? None. There is no database for VCF file. Generally, what happens? You perform a next generation sequencing experiment. You get fastq files, and uh, after fastq files, you have to process that file to get the VCF file. So there are five, uh, six intermediate steps you have to perform. So the steps can be performed by uh, Galaxy web server as well as you can perform in your own computer because uh, this bacterial strain, the genome size is very small. So the alignment time and other time, uh, other variant calling time will take very less, uh, very less time in comparison to like bigger organisms like human whose genome size is much larger. So to get the VCF file, you have to analyze the data itself. So there are different sources where you can also find the FastQ data sets as well. Like uh, I have mentioned one browser called Patrick browser for pathogen genomic data resources. You can also go to the NCBA SRA to find uh, genomic data set from different kinds of experiments. And from those data, FastQ data, you can generate the VCF file uh, by analyzing them in Galaxy or even in your own computer. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Is there any uh, any website for uh, actually I am working on drug discovery for tuberculosis, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any any website for the um, uh, mutation something for the tuberculosis, sir? So uh, for part I also also uh, during my PhD working in the domain of tuberculosis research. So I uh, there are there are tools like uh, some tool called Gen TB. There are two three databases. Uh, I think one also, I think the comment got truncated at some point. So there are tools, but particularly for tuberculosis and tuberculosis is a very widely researched topic. So you will find uh, a lot of tools to generate uh, VCF files in case of tuberculosis. Like there is, uh, if you want particular mentions, you can go to Gen TB. Uh, then there is TV profiler, another tool called TV profiler. 
there is one tool called sam tv i actually provided the link i think uh, it got truncated because the uh, i have reached, reached the sentence limit in uh, the chat let me paste it again so the sam tv actually requires uh, the gen tp and sam tv requires registration and uh, other other tool i have mentioned like tv profiler does not need any kind of re registration thank you sir so in this uh, particular tool uh, we got that this is the l1 uh, or level 1 is lineage 2 and uh, these are these are some other uh, nomenclature and then when the electric like, more granular nomenclature of this particular sample uh, so we can see that this is lineage 2.2 this is an ancient lineage of lineage 2 that means it is one of the ancestral strain of uh, tv so if you co correlate the sample number or if you find the metadata for this sample we'll see that this case definitely has been reported in like 10 or 15 years ago so lastly uh, i will mention like how this uh, snp uh, and the genotypes are correlated for calling the lineages and uh, variants so you can see first is reported the position the position represents in which position the which uh, genomic position so the reference genome is a continuous stretch of text uh, let's suppose is a paragraph of text that is uh, 30000 or 50000 character long and in that text which position uh, this g base comes so this first the position is mentioned then the reference allele so in case of no mutation we will see uh, in 615 uh, 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 like this particular position the uh, reference should be g so if that sample is not mutated there should be uh, g and generally in case of lineage one samples that uh, in case of like the genotype lineage one we will see uh, that if a sample is classified as lineage one there is a mutation G2A. So the base change from the reference allele of G to alternate allele of A uh, in that sample. That's why the sample was classified as uh, lineage 1. So in uh, in such fashion, in a stepwise fashion, you can further identify the sub-lineages of a sample by incorporating comparison with more mutations. And uh, this database also lets you explore the phylogenetic representation of, uh, so uh, this tool represents the uh, different representation of phylogenetics of in tuberculosis. So there is also included one uh, lineage that infects animal, mostly uh, domesticated animals like cow. Uh, so there is one strain is also known in tuberculosis known as M. bovis. And uh, most of us, most all of us might, must have received the BCG vaccines. So the BCG vaccine is uh, for uh, preventing tuberculosis infection among children in India because India is a very high TB prevalence country. So the BCG vaccine was developed uh, based on a attenuated version of M. bovis or the animal version of tuberculosis. So I'll uh, end here, and if anyone have any questions they uh, want to ask. Uh, Sir, how out. to figure out drug resistant determination? Yeah, uh, to figure out drug resistance determination, it's a reference based approach. It means you have to have a curated list of mutations that are generally associated with the drug resistance. Uh, particularly in case of tuberculosis, I can say there is a catalog by WHO. You can search for uh, tuberculosis drug resistance catalog, and it will give you an Excel file containing all the positions and nucleotide changes, the corresponding protein changes, and the gene where the change has happened, and which drug it is resistant to. 
it will, it will provide uh, be provided to you as a table and uh, for other organisms where drug resistance is a, is going to become a more common phenomena you can use the card database there are also the mutations and the stretch of nucleotide sequences is reported uh, sir yes yes sir. what are the information we can get from the tb gen website sir uh, this tb gen website uh, is currently uh, limited to the phylogenetic exploration and uh, genotype determination of uh, tuberculosis. So uh, maybe like you, if you got some VCA file of tuberculosis, uh, you can upload it here and it will let you know uh, the uh, lineage it belongs to. And also uh, you are asking about uh, VCA files uh, in, in, in this particular uh, pool, they have also uh, like provided pre-analyzed files so they have generated vca files for like around uh, 670 samples so you can also download those files and check the variants yourself okay sir, sir can you mention any pipelines in galaxy for engines data analysis uh so in galaxy uh there must be some specific pipelines uh, uh I don't use Galaxy much, so I can comment the exact name. But uh, in, in the Galaxy, you might have seen a search boxes there. And if you just want to go for a variant discovery after logging into the Galaxy platform, like variant discovery. So I think some of the curated pipelines are already, already uh, present there. Uh, if you don't come across any pipeline regarding variant calling, uh, you can go to the next uh, next flow core or nf core platform so the issue is that uh, the next flow once you have to run on your computer but they are generally very well uh, they generally provide a very uh, well description of how to run the pipeline and how to uh, get the results or how to troubleshoot and if you are working in the domain of bacterial genomics you can also perform the genomic data analysis in your own computer as well. Uh, like it only needs around uh, 8 GB of RAM or uh, four cores of CPU to get started in pathogen genomics. Thank you, sir. So can all, uh, you can also say that like so, uh, where we can get the sample data sets for uh, data, NGS data analysis, especially in cancer, sir? uh any particular organism you are uh, looking into or you just want to get started so like uh, any like a cerebral cancers or cerebrospinal cancers in humans yes. itself so let me uh introduce uh, to you a database uh, that contains most of the genomic data and one of the largest repository of next generation sequencing data it's called uh, ncbi sra so the SRA stands for uh, Sequence Read Archive. So it's people use it to deposit se sequencing data from their publications. So uh, which disease you are mentioning, cerebro? Uh, cerebral spinal cancer, sir. So let's say you search um, the cerebral spinal cancer. So I'm providing you the link to the database in the chat. So you can go there, you can search the cerebrospinal cancer. And let's say a lot of data is coming. There is some um, top organisms calling uh, ratas. So if this is from rat, there is some mouse model. But if you want to particularly focus into homo sapiens, you can just click it here. And uh, it will only filter or keep the homo sapiens sequences and let this this is this all individual records are of one sample so as i was mentioning key like uh, one vca file so this single record will generate only one vca file and there are some metadata information in the title itself uh, like like wx means wxs means whole exome sequencing as like wes this they are synonymous and if i click here uh it will show me uh, like how many how much data is present so it's 
six gigabases. So in total, it is 19 gigabases. So this gigabases represents the number of bases, not how much space it will take in your computer. And if, if I click into the run information, so the run information actually contains the actual sequence. It will uh, redirect me uh, to a repository where further information is present. And from here, uh, you, you can do, like you can get the basic idea of the sequence or you can start downloading the sequence uh, using this particular ID. So let's say I want to download uh, this particular sequence from this database. So there are multiple ways to download the sequence from NCBI SRA. So I am showing you one of the simplest methods to download the sequence. So as you can see, there are no links provided for downloading the sequences. So the database expects the people who are using the database know the command line utility. So they have a command line utility called SRA SRA tool, but let's say we don't have the command line and we want to download the data set. I'll go to a website called SRA Explorer. So if you search it on the Google, it will come as sraexplorer.info. And the accession number I have just copied from my search result. Let's say I search it here. So it will show one record, one whole exome sequencing of a female. And I have selected a sample. I have added it to the collection. And you can actually add multiple samples and download them together use this, uh, using this SRA Explorer tool. Now you can see I have one sample saved in the data sets. If I click in the data sets uh, tab, it will show uh, like different ways to download them. But I am going to use the most simplest method. So I can just go here. Uh, so for this particular sequence, uh, there are no records so like like the simplified method is available, uh, unfortunately. So so we can download it uh, from this link, and we have to do some kind of processing to convert the SRA file to uh, fast Q file. So if anybody has uh, any further question, they can drop me an email. I'm pasting my personal email in the chat. So you can reach me uh, anytime. I'll try my best to answer or satisfy your queries. And also, uh, share your feedback, how you uh, felt about this session. Sure, sir. Sir, on behalf of BioClues, I want to thank you for your enlightening talk and your effort to put it success. Your talk was not just informative, but also a thought provoking and will surely benefit in our work. Thank you once again, sir. We are looking forward for the opportunity to learn from you in future once again. Sure, Hi. definitely. I request everyone to please switch on their camera so that we can click a photo. Uh, sir, will you please stop presenting so that we can click a picture? Yeah, definitely.
एक्सक्यूज मी एक्सक्यूज मी मैम मैम कुड यू प्लीज अपडेट योर नेम योर जीमेल नेम अपीयर्स लेग्यूम लैब एक्चुअली सो दैट आई कैन अपडेट योर नेम इन द अटेंडेंस लिस्ट सर वी कैन एंड द सेशन थैंक यू सो मच Yeah sure thank you for having me bye thank you sir thank you sir